Good morning, my name is Heather Cox and today we're going to talk about catheterization. I'm going to show you some equipment before we start and then we'll move to the bedside and talk about um, some other things that you need to do before you perform the catheterization. If you'll look down at the table, I'm going to show you some actual catheters and talk to you about them. Now as you're looking at these catheters, you're going to see that there's some differences here. This first catheter here, you'll notice, this is usually what we call a red rubber catheter. And if you look at the end of it, it actually has a port here so that this sits inside the bladder and it allows the urine to drain down inside the open hole and come out the other end. If you look at the one in the middle here, you'll notice that it has the same opening here for the urine to drain out. But there's also an extension piece here, and this is where the balloon actually inflates, and this is what keeps it inside the bladder. If you look down at the end, you're also going to see that this one has two pieces at the end, whereas the other one had one. And the difference is, this is uh, where the port allows for the urine to drain, and this is actually the balloon inflation port. And some things that are important to note about, usually there's writing around the balloon inflation port, and this is where you can see that it says inflate with 10 milliliters. So it's telling you how much um, sterile water to inflate this balloon with, and then it usually gives you the size on here. And if you look, it says 16 French. So this is one place you can always come very quickly while this is in your patient, and you should be able to tell the size of the catheter and then how much um, sterile water the uh, balloon is inflated with. If you look over to this other catheter, you will notice that it actually has three ends. Now this end up here, you're going to see it still has the little open holes here. This one, however, has a couple of little different holes, and one of them allows for drainage of the urine. The other one allows for installation of fluids, and this catheter, whenever you see it, this is what you would call a three-way catheter, and it allows for drainage of urine and for um, insulation. And so if you look at the end, you'll see that there are three ends down here. You're going to have the balloon port where you inflate the balloon to help keep the catheter inside the patient's bladder. You're going to have the drainage port, which is where the urine comes out. And then you're going to have a port here where you can actually instill the irrigant. Um, and if you don't end up instilling irrigant, you can actually put a cap in this and close it off. Going back to the balloon port, if you look at this one, you can see very quickly that it says 18 French. So it's telling you the size of the catheter. And if you flip it back over, this one says 30 cc's. And so for this one, it has a larger balloon in it due to the size of the catheter, so that when you inflated it, you would have to inflate it with 30 cc's of sterile water. So always make sure that you look at your packaging and that you know what type of catheter you have and that you know what size it is, be it a 16 French or be it an 18 French, and then how much that you need to inflate the balloon with or if you're going to use a catheter that does not have a balloon, which means it would go in and you would drain the urine and it would come straight back out. Another thing to note would be, like we said, the size of the catheters. So while I was talking, you heard me say that this one is a 16 French and this one is an 18 French. If you'll notice, the 18 French is larger than the 16 French. And with catheters, just like with NG tubes, they follow the French system. So the smaller the number, the smaller the catheter. Thus, you can see the 16 French is going to be smaller than the 18 French. And it's always important for you to know what size catheter you need to use on your patient. Um, normally with children, you're probably going to use a 5 French, most likely with an infant. Um, an 8 French tends to be with pediatric type patients. When you get up to um, adults, then 16 French is most commonly used, and that's what comes in your kits and most of your hospitals where they're already pre-attached. Once you get up to the three-way catheters, the catheter has to be a little bit larger because it needs to also allow for installation of irrigation fluids, thus the size of an 18 French, or you could even go up to a 20 or a 22 French. The reason you need to um, go for the size of the catheters, though, is because your patient's urethra varies in size based on their anatomy and also um, their age. So certainly a infant or pediatric patient is going to have a smaller urethra than an adult. And sometimes different patients will need smaller catheters. So even though I might have an adult female, I might end up having to go down from a 16 French to a 14. So you always need to make sure you assess the size of your patient's urethra for tolerance. And sometimes you won't know until you get in there and get ready to place the catheter. And if you meet resistance, then you might have to um, start all over again and come back with a smaller catheter. 
So we've talked about some different types of catheters and different sizes. Another thing you need to note is these catheters are all latex. So you all need to make sure that your patient is not allergic to latex before you use these catheters. If your patient is allergic to latex, they do have special catheters that are silicone or Teflon, and you would need to use some of those instead. Um, and to finish addressing allergies, you're usually going to clean your patient with betadine, so you're always going to want to ask if they're allergic to betadine as well, and you might have to use another cleansing agent. So we've talked about some different catheters. Um, you know, this one here, like I said, might be used for what we would call an in and out specimen so that I'm just going in to see how much urine my patient has in their bladder for retention purposes or if I'm only going to get a specimen. This one here would be more of what we would call a retention catheter and this would actually stay in the patient and allow for drainage of urine. And then again, this one would allow for drainage of urine but also um, irrigations. So you always want to make sure you know the reason for the catheter. If it is for retention of urine, that would be a reason that you would put it in. Also, your patient might be going for surgery and sometimes the anesthesia um, you know, can cause your patient to not be able to urinate on their own. Also, if you need close monitoring of output, then you would um, have the catheter placed. If you have a bladder outlet obstruction, then that could require that you have one of these placed in there. Um, what we would call a post-void residual. So you're going to have your patient go and urinate in the bathroom and then put the catheter in and see how much urine is still in the bladder. Also, your patient might have an open wound in the sacral or perineal area so that you don't want the urine to get into the wound and cause issues with the healing. We already discussed the specimen um, obtaining of that or then irrigations of the bladder, either with just normal saline or if they have medications and we have to actually instill the medications. Now I'm going to move over and we're going to talk about some other equipment that you might need. So I'm going to switch tables. Okay. So if you look at this table, you're going to see some other equipment on here. While you are performing the catheterization, you always want to provide for privacy of your patient. And so when we enter, we certainly would close the door and close the curtain. But if you look to this side, you're going to see that I have a bath blanket. Um, or you might actually have some other sheets or things that you might use. And this would provide for privacy because your patient can get cold and you also want to keep them covered in this um, procedure. Some of the other equipment you might see in obtaining a specimen. Um, if you're going to use just a simple in and out catheter, it would drain directly into the receptacle. But if the catheter is already in place, Evidence-based practice states that it's best to obtain the specimen from the port on the catheter, and I'll show you this a little bit later. In order to do that, you would need some hemostats without teeth so that they don't end up causing a hole in the catheter um, drainage tube. And that would actually clamp off the tube so that the urine could build up. And then you would need a needleless syringe, usually 10 or 20 cc's so that it can connect to the port. You'd need some alcohol or whatever your agency policy says to clean the port before you um, connect the syringe to obtain it. You would need a sterile specimen cup to obtain the specimen. And you're going to need a biohazard bag um, to transport the specimen. You'll also need labels with the patient's name, date of birth, medical record number, and things for these specimens. Some of the other equipment you would need, you'll see that I've got um, some perineal pads. You could have either this disposable kind or you could have the cloth pads or both. Other equipment I've got here, this is um, an example of an in and out kit and this is just whenever you're inserting the catheter so you can obtain the specimen or drain the urine to see how much is in there. You're also going to see I have some irrigation equipment back here to the back and you'll notice that I have normal saline or 0.9% sodium chloride. And as with any of your equipment, you always want to make sure that it's clean, dry, and intact within the expiration date, hasn't been opened. You're going to see here that I've also got what we would call a Tumi syringe, or sometimes you'll actually have irrigation tray sets that you'll use, because when you irrigate, you need to make sure that you're doing it um, in a sterile manner. Some of the other things you might have when your patient has a urinary catheter, normally you're going to encourage your patient to drink fluids unless it is a restriction. For instance, if your patient has congestive heart failure and they're on fluid restrictions. Some of the other equipment you'll also see here, this is what we call TheraWorks, and you're going to have several different things here with it. You've got the specialty care pack, which are the wipes that you clean both before you insert the catheter and then after you insert the catheter. 
And then you've got the TheraWorks here. This is the Broad Spectrum Hygiene Management. This is the spray that you keep at the bedside. And I have a handout here that I'm actually going to post on Moodle for you guys so y'all can see it. It's called the TheraWorks 2-Pack Cloth and TheraWorks Foam. And what it does is it gives you instructions that say, in this pack of the TheraWorks, you use the first wipe to clean when you're doing the perineal care before you get ready to catheterize and then you're going to clean with the betadine or whatever cleansing agent your agency policy says and then perform the catheterization and after the catheterization is done then you use the second wipe to get off the betadine and make sure that everything is good and clean. Then it comes back and it talks about the foam spray and you use this every 8 to 12 hours Unless your patient is incontinent, you can use it more frequently. And in this system, it helps promote um, less infection with your catheters because what you're always worried about is what we call a catheter-associated urinary tract infection or CAUTI, C-A-U-T-I. And this will be posted on Moodle for you guys to review. And then lastly on the tray, you'll notice that I have what we call the... Um, this is actually the Foley catheterization tray. And this one you'll see has already been opened, so certainly I wouldn't want to use this, but I've got another one over here that is closed. So if you look at this one, this one is the new kit that they use at one of the agencies we currently go to clinical. You will have different kits, and so you'll have to get used to using them, but this is the one I'm going to show you today. If you notice, this one is a sure step Foley tray system, and very quickly on here, you can see that it is a 16 French, which is very commonly used for uh, ladies and men of adult size. It's going to tell you that it has a drainage bag already attached, and if you'll notice, it says it has a 2,000 milliliter drainage bag. It also goes through and tells you that it has a Statlock Foley stabilization device. It goes through and further tells you, I need to know what the use for this catheter is. Because you're always going to want to know the reason that the doctor has ordered the catheter, because maybe they put the order in on the wrong patient and you don't want to go put a catheter in somebody who doesn't need one. Also, you're going to need to be able to talk to your patient about the reason for the Foley catheter before you begin. So it comes through here and it says, does your patient meet the CDC guidelines for indwelling your uh, urethral catheter use? And it goes through, patient has acute urinary retention or bladder outlet obstruction, need for accurate urine output measurements, use for selected surgical procedures to assist in healing of open sacral or perineal wounds, Patient requires prolonged immobilization and to improve comfort for end-of-life care. So we've covered some of these reasons already. It further goes through and tells you that this is the equipment that is contained in here. So you always want to examine your package before you start to make sure it is clean, dry, and intact and that it is within the expiration date, but also what's in it so that you know if you need other equipment. For instance, with this one, it says this pre-connected closed system Foley tray contains. There's some key words here, pre-connected closed system Foley tray. Pre-connected means that the catheter is already connected to the urinary drainage bag and it's telling you it's a closed system, so that helps prevent urinary tract infections. If you look in here, it says it has the Bardex anti-infective Foley catheter. It has the Statlock securement device, the antimicrobial control outlet device, an anti-reflux chamber, bacteriostatic drainage tube, bacteriostatic collection bag, which would hold up to 2,000 milliliters, three foam swabs, and pov povidone iodine. So this does contain iodine. You'd have to bring another agent if your patient is allergic to iodine. It has a pericare kit, and it has soap towelettes and some hand sanitizer. Now, very commonly, you know, some of your agencies will go ahead and allow you to use the soap towelettes to clean your patient, but you always have to follow your facility policy for what you're supposed to be cleaning with. So, for instance, at the agency that we go to, they require that you use the TheraWorks before you start and then again after you insert the catheter. But while you're actually in the sterile procedure, you have betadine. So always make sure you review that. Another thing you would always want to note on here is whether this has latex in it. And this one does. And so I, again, I would need to assess for my patient's allergies. So we've talked about the equipment. One other piece of equipment I want to show you. You will look here. I also have a light. And sometimes it requires a different light source. 
and in your actual check sheet it discusses using a flashlight and you could certainly do that if you need to but you're going to need an assistant. If you use this light source normally you can put it above your head so that it shines down on the patient's perineal area and it does not obscure your field or cause issue with contamination while you're doing a sterile procedure. Certainly you're going to need a trash can close by and then um, you're going to need to be able to have an adjustable bed whenever you go in to perform the catheterization. So we've reviewed the equipment. Now I'm probably going to go ahead and go into the room and we're going to start with the catheterization. Before we go into the room, I would always want to check the doctor's order to make sure that I have an order for this patient, make sure it matches and it is the correct patient, and I need to know the reason for the catheterization. We've already talked about that. So before I start, I would certainly want to talk to the reason um, for the catheter with the patient and make sure they understand that. And then if there are any assessments I need to make, I would have needed to have done that before I come in to put the catheter in. Some of those assessments might include palpating the bladder and I'll make sure and show you where that's at. And normally you would not palpate your bladder on your patient because it should not be full. But if you can palpate it, that would mean that it's abnormal and it's full and they might be having some retention. Some other things you might do would be a bladder scan so that you could confirm how much urine is um, being retained in the bladder before you do your actual catheterization. And when you do the cleaning of the patient when you're doing perineal care, you can actually examine your patient to see if you can find the urethra easily. Also, you can uh, assess your patient's mobility to see if they can move and bend their legs. And it might um, let you know if you need an assistant. If your patient is combative or confused, you might need some help whenever you go in as well. Because most of the time, whenever you're performing catheterizations, you're usually in there by yourself with the patient. But if you have mobility issues with the patient or if your patient is confused or combative, you might need some extra assistance. And so we're now going to go into the room. Now that we've discussed the equipment and things you need to do before you catheterize the patient, I'm now going to enter the patient's room. So as I'm entering, I'm going to knock. I'm going to foam as I enter the room. Good morning, Mrs. Smith. My name is Heather. I'm here to do a catheterization on you this morning. I'm going to pull the curtain for privacy. Mrs. Smith, I'm going to go ahead and check your armband here. If you'll please tell me your full name and date of birth. So as I'm doing this, I've acknowledged the patient. I've also identified the patient. And I'm going to go ahead and explain the duration and explanation of the procedure I'm doing. So Ms. Smith, as I said, my name's Heather. I'm your nurse today. I'm here to do the catheterization. And as we talked about earlier, it seems like you're having what we call your near retention. I, I had come in earlier and we had... Um, pressed on your belly a little bit and you said that you haven't peed in a while and you're having some retention of urine. We did the bladder scan and that. So we've determined the reason for the catheterization and we're going to explain that to her and make sure she feels okay with that. We're going to go ahead and ask her if she has any allergies. Miss Smith, do you have any allergies, especially to latex or betadine? Because as we discussed before, your catheter usually has latex and then you're usually cleaning with betadine during the procedure. And she says she has no allergies, so we're going to proceed on with what is ordered. Um, I'm going to go ahead and raise your bed and do a few things so we can get started. Do you have any questions? So again, we've performed acknowledge, introduce, duration, explanation. I've asked her about her allergies and identified the patient. So I'm going to go ahead and um, tell her I'm going to put a um, pad down underneath her. So if you'll look and see, I've got some waterproof pads. You can also use the actual cloth chucks to put underneath your patient. I'm going to have to uncover you for a minute here, ma'am, okay? So when you're doing this, of course, provide for your patient privacy. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and slide this underneath her hips. And usually if you get your patient to raise the hips up, then they can help you out. Of course, I'm dealing with the mannequin today, so I've got to kind of do this myself. So as you look, you always want to make sure that you've got it underneath the perineal area enough so that when you have drainage, and then you want to have it out here enough so that it catches anything while you're doing this. And so we've got the um, waterproof pad underneath her hips. And like I said, you could use the cloth pad or you can use the disposable ones. I usually bring several into the room because you're going to have to clean your patient and do perineal care before you actually start the procedure. Um, another thing you'll see here, I have my alternate light source in place. And so when it's time, I will use that. You want to make sure that it doesn't get in your area, you know, and you don't hit yourself in the head or that it falls on your patient or any of that kind of stuff. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and roll up her bed, okay? You want to make sure that you get it up high enough. Most folks get it up to elbow level for them. If you'll notice, I am right-handed, so I'm also standing on the right side of the bed. If you're left-handed, you will normally stand on the left side of the bed, but always make sure you 
do what you feel comfortable with. Now, if you'll notice, like I said, I'm usually up about elbow height. You, you want to make sure your bed is high enough so that when you're actually down here doing the procedure, you're not having to bend over with your back and it makes it easier for you to visualize your structures. The next thing you're going to want to do is make sure you provided for privacy for your patient. And there's a couple of different ways to do this. As we said before, you've got a bath blanket so you can drape your patient's legs and things. One thing I usually do is I pull the bed covers up because they're going to be cold up on this part of their body. And very often what I do is I pull the covers up from the bottom part of the bed and I would uncover their legs. Now I'm still keeping her gown down here to provide for privacy, but you'll notice she's got her covers up here on her chest. The other thing you could do is you could come, and again, as they probably you know, explained to you in your CNA school, whenever you were doing your bath and things, you can actually take your bath blanket and wrap it around your patient's legs and provide for warmth and privacy. I'm not gonna do that here for the sake of the video because you guys are not going to be able to see anything that I'm doing. So what I'm going to do is move the bath blanket and we'll say that we've provided privacy for the patient and we've provided warmth. The next thing we're now going to do is perform perineal care on Ms. Smith before we get started. And you always want to do this with any patient that you're going to catheterize because you need to make sure that your patient is clean. There's no stool or anything in here that would lead to a catheter-associated urinary tract infection. The other thing this allows is for you to assess your patient's anatomy to see if you can find the urethra easily, you can assess her movement, and if you are gonna need assistance, and if she is confused or compatible, if you're gonna need assistance in that manner. The next thing I'm gonna do, you'll notice, I'm gonna to explain to her that I'm gonna lay your head down, Mrs. Smith. With ladies, this is important because if her head is up, it's putting pressure down here on her perineal area, and it will actually um, cause the structures to be occluded. You won't be able to see as well. So I usually lay my patient's head as flat as possible if they can tolerate it. If they can't, then you have to kind of work with it. And once you lay them flat, you may have to raise the bed up a little bit. Another thing that you could actually do, you could put your patient in a mild Trendelenburg just with her head down a smidge so that it takes more pressure off of this area. Now, I'm going to go ahead and uncover her, and I'm going to let you take a look at the structures here with me while we're getting ready to clean her, and we're going to discuss that. I'm also going to discuss how you might need to position her if she's contracted and some of that. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to foam my hands again, and then I'm going to go put my gloves on. And my gloves are actually on the opposite side of the bed. At this point, if that was truly what had happened, I would need to put her bed back down and then start over again. So I'm going to grab the gloves. So now I have my gloves on and I've got her uncovered. Again, you would be providing privacy for your patient, but I'm leaving this open so you can actually see. So I'm gonna explain to Miss Smith, I'm gonna go ahead and clean you with some wipes and things. And as I'm doing this, this would be the time that I would assess her anatomy. I'm gonna take a minute and go ahead and show you the anatomy here. So if you're looking here right now, on your adult female patient, you'll notice that you have the labia majora, which are the, the larger um, set of the uh, labia here, and then inside you're gonna see the labia minora. So whenever you're going to catheterize your female patient, you actually have to open the labia majora and then open up the labia minora because the urethra is down inside. And when you look here, I'm gonna show you the structures. Labia majora, labia minora, and once you open them up, you now have the clitoris up here at the top. You've got the urethra in the middle, which is the hole that's sitting there for you. And then the vagina is down below. So for your anatomical structures, what you need to remember is labia majora and minora, and you have to get in there and open them both up. And then at the top, you have the clitoris. In the middle, you have the urethra, and down below, you have the vagina. Now, very commonly, whenever folks are catheterizing ladies, they will inadvertently insert the catheter into the vagina. And if you do that, you want to go ahead and leave that catheter in there so that when you get your next kit, you'll actually know where not to go. But you need to make sure you explain to the patient certainly why I'm leaving that in there. So I've gone through here and I can actually see her urethra quite well. And this is one of the reasons that whenever you're doing your perineal care before, you want to examine your patient because it could be that you can't see the urethra very well. Um, sometimes it has actually kind of withdrawn up inside the patient's vagina and it's a little bit harder to see. So I know um, at this point too, I'm actually going to get her to move her legs and see if she can move them. So I'm assessing for her mobility and if there's any issues. If she had contractures, for instance, at this point, I could actually turn her on her side, and I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to show you the anatomy again. And again, I've got to kind of work here because this is a mannequin. 
as I turn her on her side, and she would have to be helping me here, certainly, I would have to move her leg over and do this in a sideline position. And again, your anatomy is the same. The clitoris, the urethra, and the vagina, and I would actually have to use this hand to open it up. Now, it's harder to do a sideline catheterization, so you're probably going to need some assistance if you end up having to do that. But I just want you to understand, sometimes you might have to do that if your patient has contractures or can't um, be able to move. At this point, we're now ready to go and use the TheraWorks, which is the prescribed cleaning agent um, for one of the agencies that we go to. Again, you need to review your agency policy to see what your agency uh, requires for your perineal care beforehand. In this, we would open it up and there would be two wipes. I would take out the first wipe and I'm supposed to use this to clean the perineal area before we actually open up the sterile kit. When I'm cleaning, you actually are supposed to focus on the meatal area, which is around the urethral meatus. So when I clean, I always clean from top to bottom on ladies, and you only do one stroke, you know, per area. If you need more of these, then you would certainly need to have more. And I can allow this to close at this point. Whenever I'm actually doing the sterile part, I can't. So I've used my first wipe, and at this point, I would need to make sure that I have my trash can over here. So I'm going to go ahead and move it over here with my foot. And I would throw this then in the trash receptacle or whatever the appropriate um, disposal agent is according to your facility policy. At this point, I've now cleaned my patient, so I can go ahead and I can take off these gloves and I can go ahead and foam again. And I'm going to go ahead and explain to Mrs. Smith that I'm now to the part of the procedure to where I'm ready to open up and become sterile. Again, I'm going to save the other TheraWorks wipe and use it whenever I'm done with the procedure. If the waterproof pad had become contaminated at this point, I could have changed it before I took off my gloves and put a new one on there. We didn't end up contaminating it. It's still dry, so I'm just going to leave this one over here, and we'll come back and use it at a later point. Now, I need to make sure, as always, with sterile procedures, that my table is at least waist height, and I don't want to go below the table. I need to make sure that the table is clean and dry. And I need to make sure that I'm not talking over my field, reaching over it, you know, any of those kind of things. So any equipment that I don't need to be in the way, I need to go ahead and get that out of the way. Before I start, I need to make sure and examine my equipment and make sure it's clean, dry, and intact, and that it's within the expiration date. Again, I've already talked to her about allergies with latex and betadine. She doesn't have any of those things. I've already addressed the need for this. I understand why it's here. Um, I've explained it to the patient. We've discussed it. So I'm going to go ahead and open this up at this point. And as I open this, I'm going to go ahead and take the kit out, and we're going to discuss some of the pieces and parts that are in here. You could go ahead and take your bag from your catheter tray, and you could fold it down. And you could put it down here at the foot of the bed and make this be your trash can if that's what you want to do. If you don't want to do that, you could actually take it and you could throw it away in the trash can. That's what I do. I make sure and keep my trash can right below me where I can find it easily. Some of the other pieces and parts in this kit you're going to see. It says stop and cleanse the periurethral area first. Well, we've already done that per the policy that we're following with the TheraWorks. But in some of your agencies, it might be that you would actually use this Castile soap towelette as a cleanser for your perineal care before you start, and they actually put some hand sanitizer in here for you. So you may or may not use that based on your facility policy. They've also got some things in here that help you with patient education that talk about your Foley catheter. You want to take catheters out as soon as you can and make sure you're not prolonging the use so that you can prevent what we call associated urinary tract infection or CAUTI, C-A-U-T-I. Make sure your catheter tubing is secured to your leg or abdomen if possible because it prevents urethral trauma. Make sure the hospital staff wash or sanitize hands before they touch the catheter. Do not tug, pull, or twist the catheter tubing, and it needs to remain without kinks. And it also, the catheter bag needs to remain below the level of the bladder. You never want urine to back back up in the bladder because that puts you at risk for the catheter-associated urinary tract infection. And then always avoid disconnecting the catheter from the drain tube if you can help it because you want to maintain that closed system to prevent the catheter-associated urinary tract infection. You'll notice on the back side they also have this in Spanish. And this is a card you can actually give to your patient to do with their education. They've got some directions for use in here that talks about proper techniques, and it talks about proper techniques for maintenance. 
And then in here it goes through and it talks to you about how to actually put the catheter kit in and how to obtain the specimens. The last thing we're going to talk about here are some labels. And this is a new thing that they've started putting in their kits as well. What you'll normally do is you'll come in and um, these labels will actually peel off and go in um, extra areas. So for instance, if you see this label here, I would put down the date and time that I inserted it, the department it was inserted in, and I would also put my initials. And this then would actually peel off and go on the catheter bag once I'm done. And this one here again, date and time, department and initials, and this one goes around. You actually have in here the date and time that the catheter was inserted and it's actually on the bag and the tubing and people can follow it throughout your patient's care. It also goes through and reminds you of what is the appropriate use for the catheter. Now if you look at this, I now have the tray. There are several different ways that you can go about doing this. On your check sheet, it speaks to opening the catheter kit on the bedside table and moving on in that manner. Sometimes you'll see that it will allow you to put it between the patient's legs and open it up actually um, on the bed. The main thing you're worried about whenever you do any sterile procedure is maintaining sterility. So always remember your sterile procedures and what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do before you do this. If you look at this kit, it says orient toward insertion site. So the arrow always needs to point towards the patient if I'm going to put this between the patient's legs. Now, we've discussed um, how the package will be oriented, and it says orient toward the insertion site. And in your skills checklist, it speaks to the fact that you can either open the kit on the bedside table or you can put it between the patient's legs and open it there. I'm actually going to move this kit between the patient's legs so the arrow will actually be pointed towards the patient and the insertion site. So I'm going to pick this up now, and it's still a closed, sterile package, clean, dry, and intact. And I'm going to go ahead and move this over here at this point. So if you follow me, I've now got the tray down here between the patient's legs. If you're going to use this technique, you need to make sure that your patient is alert and oriented, that they're able to get their legs out far enough to be able to accommodate the tray, um, that they're not going to do any movement of the legs so that they don't contaminate your sterile field. So at this point, I've got it oriented toward the insertion site. I'm going to go ahead and it says peel to open, so I'm going to do that at this point. And you'll see that it's wrapped, so I'm going to go ahead and open this up. And now that I've got the kit open, you can kind of see the pieces and parts in it. Um, normally, you know that you wouldn't be talking over your sterile field, but again, I'm doing this so I can explain the kit to you. At this point, I need to put on my sterile gloves. So I'm going to reach in and I'm going to grab the sterile gloves. And I've got a bedside table over here that I'm going to put the gloves on. Um, but whenever I turn, I need to make sure that I never turn my back on the sterile field. So I'm going to pick the gloves up without contaminating the field or touching anything else. I'm going to take the gloves over here to the table. I would have already cleaned the table and made sure that it was clean and dry. And I'm going to go ahead and open up the sterile glove package at this point. Now I'm ready to put my gloves on. I'm still to the side of my sterile field, so I've got it in my view. I'm going to pick my glove up and I'm going to step back, making sure I keep these above my waist making sure that the fingers do not touch um, my hand so that I don't contaminate the glove. And I'm going to peel the glove up my hand without contaminating. Now, I've got this glove and I can take it and put it underneath the cuff of the other glove. Again, step back, put my hand in here without contaminating any of the fingers, keep it above my waist. Always keep my gloves and my hands above my waist. I do not have to do anything with the package on the table, so I'm just going to leave it there. I've actually got my trash can down here right underneath me. So I'm going to come back over here to my sterile field, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up the sterile drape and get back away from the field so that I'm not shaking over the top of it. You will see that there is a shiny side and then the other side. The shiny side is the one that goes down. So what I need to do is turn it around without contaminating it, and I need to fold my hands up in the drape, and this is the point where your patient has to actually be able to lift their hips up a little bit to kind of help you do what you need to do. So at this point, I'm going to move the tray 
and the trash can and the table back a little bit. The tray is still between her legs. I've got this uh, drape around my hand. I'm going to come underneath her, and this is a sterile drape, so it's okay to come over the top of the other one. I'm going to come in without contaminating my hands and make sure that I've got the drape down and under her, but that the drape is down enough so that it does not contaminate um, my hands or get in the way of the patient's perineal area. So now what I have done, I've opened the kit between her legs and established a sterile field and taken the sterile drape and established another sterile field over the top of it. At this point, you're going to see that you have a fenestrated drape here in the tray. With ladies, I do not use this fenestrated drape, but it depends on what your facility policy is. You could go ahead and put it over her like we do the male. At this point, it's still sterile. I'm not going to use it. I'm just going to come put it over here, or I'm going to put it in the trash can, whatever you want to do with it. Now you're going to come back down here and focus on the kit, and I'm going to go through the pieces and parts of the kit and how you need to organize it. If you'll look in the kit, it says number one is open the iodine. So I'm actually going to pull up the iodine. And at this point, I would peel the corner and I would pour the iodine for step number two over the swabs. Now that I've poured the iodine over the kit, I'm going to come back over here and I'm actually going to drop the iodine down in the trash can. And you notice I never lowered my hand below my waist. I just let it fall because you don't want to have your hands below your waist because you could contaminate. Now I'm going to come back over here and I've done step one, open iodine. I've done step two, pour the iodine over to swabs. I'm going to go to step three. So I'm going to grab the actual sterile water here and it says attach sterile water to the syringe. The first thing I'm going to do is take this tip of the cap off. It's still sterile, so it's up to you if you want to leave it in there or throw it away. I'm going to come over here to the actual Foley catheter and you will see that the catheter is actually already attached to the drainage bag and you always want to ensure that that is true. And you come back over here and here's the balloon port and again it says inflate with 10 milliliters and it confirms that it is a 16 French catheter. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is go ahead and attach the sterile water to the balloon port and at this point it would be a good thing for you to go ahead and take this plastic off of the catheter. So what you can do is you can just work it up off the catheter, but as you're doing this, always make sure that you're controlling the catheter because you don't want the catheter to fall and land somewhere where it gets contaminated. At this point, I'm going to take this blue wrapper and I'm actually going to take it and just drop it into the trash can without contaminating my hand or getting below my waist. I'm now going to come over here and I'm going to maneuver this a little bit and at this point I'm actually just going to tuck the catheter back into the tray because the next piece I need to do is come and grab the lubricant and this is sterile lube lubricating gel it's water soluble single use it comes in the kit what I would do at this point is I would go ahead and take the cap off and then I would squirt the gel down in my tray for my lubrication okay once I'm done with this, I'm going to go ahead and drop the lubricating gel down into the trash can. Again, not lowering my hands below my waist. And I'm now to the point to where I'm ready to lubricate the catheter. So what you can do is you can come and you can put it in the lubrication gel. And you need to lubricate about two to three inches. You can actually leave the catheter in the lubricating gel so it maintains lubrication. It also helps prevent your catheter be from becoming contaminated. So at this point, I have now prepared the tray. I've done step one, opening the iodine, step two, pouring the iodine, step three, attaching the water syringe, and I went ahead and took the catheter out of the protective pack, and then I did step four, which is where I squirted the lubricant out and actually lubricated the catheter. At this point, I am now actually ready um, to clean my patient with the betadine. I have already pre-cleaned her with the Theraworks as it speaks, and um, you need to go ahead and review the Theraworks handout that's on Moodle. So I'm now going to come up here and I'm going to go ahead and contaminate my non-dominant hand. So if you will look, I'm going to come up here and I'm going to go ahead and open up the labia majora and the labia minora and make sure I've got a good grip here because if these close at any point in time and I've already cleaned the patient, then I'm going to have to go back and re-clean her. You always want to make sure you've got a good grip here and keep everything there before you start. All right, I'm actually going to take the first swab 
and I'm going to get the excess out. And when you clean with ladies, you need to make sure that you clean from top to bottom and you clean from side to side and down the middle of the urethra last. But you only use one swipe for each swab. So the first swab, I'm going to come and I'm going to clean down the outside on the labia minora. And you'll see I take the swab and I lower it and I drop it into the trash can without dropping my hand below my waist. I now come back for the second swab and again I need to come down the other side of the labia minora and down. You'll see I do not cross back over my sterile field so I come towards me and away and then I'm going to drop it into the trash can. The same thing with the last one, excess of the um, iodine or betadine out. And the last wipe goes right down over the urethral meatus. I come back towards me and not over my sterile field. Then I drop my swab down into the trash can and my hand never lowers below my waist. I'm now to the point to where I'm ready for insertion because I have cleaned um, the patient. So I'm going to come back over here and I'm actually going to move my tray forward just a smidge here because I want to make sure that I don't have any contamination of the catheter. I can do that because this hand is still sterile. So I'm ready for insertion. I'm going to make sure I maintain my grip so that I don't contaminate, don't contaminate the tip of the catheter. I'm going to go ahead and insert and as I'm inserting I'm backing my uh, dominant hand off. I'm going to insert the two to three inches for the catheter and as I do that I'm going to see urine come down the drainage tubing and once I see urine I insert another two to three inches and as I get there to the two to three inches, I'm now going to move this hand back and secure with this hand. Now I'm going to come down and take this hand, which is still sterile, and I'm going to inflate the balloon. If I meet any resistance at this point, I would make sure and stop the inflation of the balloon, but I'm not. So I'm going to go ahead and keep this here. Please remember that you want to hold pressure on the end of the syringe so that any of the sterile water doesn't back back down here. I'm now going to move this back up here and let go of the catheter so that I can um, unconnect this. And this, I'm done with the sterile part, so I'm going to let go here and you're going to see that I'm going to tug back on the catheter. You may see some of the catheter kind of ease back out a little bit if you insert a little bit further than the two to three inches. You want to make sure that you don't tug too tightly because you could cause urethral trauma on the patient. At this point, I've got gel and I've probably got betadine and all this stuff on my hands. So now would probably be a good time for me to go and change into clean gloves. And once I've got the clean gloves on, this would be the point to where I would want to go ahead and place the securement device. Now that I've got my clean gloves on, I'm going to go ahead and you should have on your actual catheter bag, the securement device is usually contained down here. So what you would do is you would go ahead and peel this off. And once you get this out of here without pulling on your patient, keep that down below the level of the bladder. And you can actually take this out. And if you'll notice in here, they've got the stat lock or the securement device. And you see it says on here, there's also skin protectant pads. Now when you go through and do this, you want to make sure that you put the, the actual catheter tube in here and connect it before you push it down on the paper on the patient, excuse me. So when you do this, if you'll look, there's only one way it can fit in here. And what you want to do is push from the side. Once you get this in here properly, let me turn it around so you guys can actually see it. Here you go. So if you'll notice, once I do it, I push on the side and now this is locked in here. You would go down and make sure that your patient straightens their leg out. And when you put it, you want to put it on the top of the leg, not the inside, because you don't want it rubbing. Um, if they have any limited mobility on one leg, you probably wouldn't want to put it there. If this was the surgical leg, you wouldn't want to put it on that side. If there's weepy lesions or anything, you don't want it in that area. You want to make sure that they can move their leg if this was secured, that it's not pulling. So once you find that level, back up about an inch. And then I would go ahead and put the skin protectant on here and you need to allow it to dry. And then I would come through and I would peel each side and secure this down to my patient's leg. And now I've got the securement device on here. Now, depending on age policy, most of them require that you change this securement device about every seven days. So we've now got this secured and this keeps from having trauma on the urethra. I would get rid of anything else in my kit that I did not need. As long as my specimen cup was not contaminated, I could actually take it and I could sit it in the lid 
over here on the counter if I wanted to do that without contaminating the top or the inside or the inside of the lid. And I could go ahead and fold up the rest of this stuff and this could all go in either the trash can or per facility policy, whatever the actual um, disposal device was supposed to be, red bag or whatever. Now that I've done this, I can actually come back and clean her with the other Therawork wipe. And when you use the other Therawork wipe, what you would do is the same thing we did before. You would come here and your main area you're concerned about with this would be the actual urethral area. So I would clean around the catheter and I clean from top to bottom and down the catheter and away. Always make sure you go back and review per your hospital policy what your um, catheter care and cleaning is supposed to be and all that stuff. Now I'm done with this, I could actually remove the actual drapes and any other drapes that were contaminated underneath her. I could come back and I could take off my gloves and I could actually foam. And again, I would gonna go ahead and pull this down and provide for patient privacy and um, you know, move on with whatever else I needed to do. At the end of this, I'm gonna go ahead and discuss how I would go about getting a specimen from this. There are some agencies that still allow for you to obtain the specimen from the actual catheter bag if you have initially put this in. Best practice tells us the best place to get it is from the actual specimen port, even if you just put the catheter in. So in order to do that, what I would have to do is have some equipment, and that equipment would include. So to obtain the specimen, the equipment that you would need, you're gonna need some alcohol wipes or whatever your cleaning agent is from your facility. You're going to need a needleless um, actual syringe here, and you probably want either a 10 or a 20 cc syringe, depending on how much urine you need for your actual specimen. You're gonna need a sterile specimen cup, you're gonna need the bag, and you're gonna need a patient label with their name, date of birth, and medical record number, and you're gonna need actually um, some, for, some hemostats here. So if you look at this, I'm gonna come over here, and I'm gonna go ahead and take the hemostats, and I'm actually gonna occlude the tubing here below the level of the port so that the urine can kinda stand up a little bit so I can get the specimen. So I'm gonna come through and I'm actually gonna clamp this off and make sure I don't clamp my patient's leg or any of that kind of stuff. And as I said, what that's gonna do is make you have backup of urine here in this tube. And then I would need to have gloves on at this point. And when I put my gloves on, I would come through and I would take the alcohol pad or whatever the prescribed agent is and I would go ahead and clean this for at least 30 seconds and allow it to air dry. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and get my gloves on. Okay, now that I've got my gloves on here, usually you're gonna have to wait about 15 or 20 minutes for the urine to build up here. Please do not forget that you actually have this clamped because if you put the catheter in, you know, probably for urinary retention, this is certainly gonna cause the urinary retention to be worse. It's not gonna be able to drain down. So you need to make sure you always come back and unclamp this when you're finished. I've cleaned off with the appropriate cleansing agent. I'm now gonna come over here and get my needleless syringe. And I need to make sure that I keep this thing the end of it, certainly without being contaminated. So when I take it out, I don't need to touch the end. I'm gonna come over here and without touching the collection port, I'm gonna come and twist this and you push in and twist to the right and it actually you know, hooks right on there. And then when I do it, I need to pull back and I would get the full 10 cc's or whatever amount of urine that I needed for the syringe. I would actually take this off I'm gonna come over here and I would have my specimen cup probably already out of the package, but as long as I don't contaminate the end of the syringe, I'm okay. I would take the cap off and sit it down on the table upside down. And without contaminating the inside of the cup or the rim, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna squirt the urine in here. Now it's up to you if you have on protective, um, protective equipment while you're doing this, especially a mask with a face shield because sometimes this could actually splash back. Then I would come over here and I would take my cap and without contaminating it, I would put this on here. I would need to make sure that I dispose of this probably in the sharps container because it actually has some urine left in it. So I would go ahead and I would do that at this point. And once I've disposed of it, then I'm gonna come back over here and I'm gonna take off my gloves and I'm gonna foam again. And then I need to go ahead and remove these hemostats because if I leave them clamped, 
then it's going to end up, you know, occluding the urine flow. Now at this point, I would go ahead and label the specimen cup with, you know, what type of specimen it is. So this one is a catheterized urine specimen, the date and time it was attained and my initials. And I would put the patient's sticker on here with the patient's name and medical record number, um, their date of birth and all that kind of stuff. I would need to put it in a specimen bag and usually you'll double bag these and then you send them down to the lab and either you'll have the little robot who comes and picks them up or takes them down. So at this point, we've now gone through how to put a catheter um, insert a catheter into an adult female and how to go through and do the cleaning before and after and then how to obtain a specimen you know from the catheter and like I said most of your agencies now want you to actually obtain the specimen from the port whether you've just put the catheter in or not. So at this point would be now whenever I would go ahead and I would cover Miss Smith back up I would ask her how she's doing does she um, need anything else from me? Do I need to reposition her? And she tells me that she wants me to put her head of the bed back up. So what I'm gonna do initially, I'm gonna lower her bed. Get her all the way down and again, provide for safety here. So I need to make sure that she's got her call bill here within reach. I'm gonna raise her head up a little bit. Whoop, that's her foot. Need to raise her bed. Her head. Why did the foot come up with that? There we go. All right, so we've got the head of the bed up just a smidge. We need to ask her if she's having any pain. Does she need to go to the bathroom? Because even though she's got a catheter here in place and is draining her urine, she might still have to go and um, defecate. And uh, she says she's not in any pain. She doesn't need to use the bathroom. I put her in the proper position. And then I need to put her belongings and everything back over here for proximity. So I'm going to make sure that she's okay. She's got her call bell. I would clean off the table, send off my specimen, pull this back over. I would thank her for allowing me to care for her. 